After Isabel, more than a dozen people dead. Power out for millions. A major city underwater. We'll show you what the hurricane did. In Iraq, 24 hours of unrelenting attacks by the enemy kill more U.S. troops. Caught on tape, this child was allegedly beaten up repeatedly by the same school bullies. Now his parents are taking action. And the fat in the cat. America's obesity epidemic is spreading to our pets. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. What was Hurricane Isabel left a big trail of trouble here in the eastern United States today before spinning on up into Canada? It will take days to fully assess, clean up, and repair the damage. Starting in North Carolina, Isabel's path inland and up through the mid-Atlantic states resulted in at least 17 deaths. The damage, insurers estimate it will cost them about $1 billion, is far less than feared, but still extensive. More than 5 million homes and businesses lost power. Many don't have it back. Shore damage is extensive. Many homes destroyed. Flooding is severe in some areas. All of this affects jobs in the national economy. In the nation's capital, government offices were closed for a second day. North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland have now been declared eligible for federal disaster help. CBS's Bob Orr begins our coverage of the aftermath. The sun rose over a calm Atlantic today, revealing a 600-mile-long trail of misery left by Isabel. From flattened beach houses on North Carolina's Outer Banks to Virginia's ravaged coastline to the nation's capital. Touched on my neighbor's house and destroyed the fence and it littered the whole alley and it crushed my car. Millions of people are dealing with Isabel's damage. The storm, which pounded the mid-Atlantic states for more than 14 hours, triggered some flooding from low-lying tidewater neighborhoods to Wilmington, Delaware and Philadelphia. But Isabel brought more wind than rain. The storm's real legacy is darkness. More than 5 million people in nine states lost power in the storm. 700,000 in North Carolina, more than a million in Pennsylvania. 1.2 million people were powerless in Maryland and 2 million in hardest hit Virginia. We have just gone through probably the worst storm in at least a generation in Isabel. And the recovery could be painfully long. Utility repair crews, some from as far away as Oklahoma, are working to clear down trees and reconnect severed lines. The lack of power also has shut down water pumping stations, leaving parts of Richmond and northern Virginia dry. The biggest problem we've got right now is no water and no power. Around Washington, utility companies handed out dry ice to thousands of people, hoping to salvage what's left in their refrigerators. But businesses face even bigger losses. I think the wind started coming in there and it was... Tony Schmidt lost power in all five of his Virginia Beach restaurants. We'll probably lose seven, eight thousand dollars a day, you know, just being shut down. Utility crews have made some progress. More than a million people of the five million plus originally affected now have had their power restored. But the pain of Isabel will linger. Many people could be without power for a week and some even longer than that. Dan? Bob Orr reporting live from Virginia, thanks. Damage to low-lying areas spilled over into heavily populated areas, not just beach resorts. CBS's Cheryl Atkinson is in the high water in and around Baltimore, Maryland. Cheryl? Dan, we're in a part of Baltimore County called Bowley's Quarters along the Chesapeake Bay. Emergency crews knew there would be a few rescues here, but it turned out there were a lot more than that, and they're still at it. From the air, you could see some of the worst flooding this area's ever had. Waves breaking through windows and boats wildly out of place. It's pretty heady stuff here. I've, again, I've, I've 23 years of policeman. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this. Even Baltimore's famous Fells Point wasn't spared the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Down the Chesapeake at Annapolis, water flooded the trendy stores along the city's historic waterfront. People chatted with passing kayakers, and urban transportation took on a new mode. In small surrounding towns, small rescue boats weren't enough for the job. 
Very scary. A lot of wind, a um, lot of rain. The water came up fast. How many hours have you been here? 18 hours. 18 hours. Yeah. And you've taken out how many people about? Me and my crew alone has probably taken about 85 people out. So amphibious duck vehicles, usually used to show tourists around Baltimore, dove in to help. It was the only way little Sarah Jasinski and her family made it to dry land. She didn't understand why the water was coming. And she kept blaming God. <laughs> All around, residents are hoping the water will go as fast as it came. Dude, I'm going to come through. When it was this deep, now I'm walking back somewhere this deep. It's going out now. Sarah Jasinski turned four this week. Born during Hurricane Floyd and rescued during Isabel, her parents just hope it's not a trend. Earlier today, the water was up to the green sign back there. So you can see the Chesapeake Bay has gone a long way to going back where it belongs. Dan? Cheryl Atkinson reporting live in Maryland. Thank you. Down the coast in North Carolina is where Isabel first stormed ashore. CBS's Cynthia Bowers reports tonight from some of the areas it hit first and hit worst. Today, Brooke Stalnicker is still coming to terms with his homelessness. Uh, I see some neighbor stuff in here, but the biggest share of this is my stuff. All that's left, thanks to flash flooding from Hurricane Isabel, he stood helplessly by at a neighbor's house as his own washed away. One of 40 homes destroyed by raging floodwaters in the small coastal town of Harlow. My wife started crying and I just, I just shook my head. There's nothing you can think or say. It's the same story across much of eastern North Carolina as cleanup continues. While yesterday's hurricane won't be mentioned in the same breath with Hugo or Andrew, it's tough to tell that to people who live along the Outer Banks. I think most everybody in this community has got anywhere from 50 to 100 percent loss. Even though Isabel's 100 mile an hour winds got top billing, it was the water that turned lives upside down. And in a place where towns have names like lowland and sea level, it's easy to understand why. Justin Mason and his family fled the 10 foot storm surge, escaping to higher ground, but came back to find their home the awash in water. Water came by here. I'm about 5'1", and it's just about over my head, so it's probably about five foot. Just next door, Mark and Don Mason's front porch looked like a garage sale as they tried to salvage what they could. It's destroyed. <laughs> it's just gone. I mean, everything we've done is gone. Even so, this young family has no intention of pulling up roots because, like so many others, they say this is God's country. But they acknowledge tonight they could use some prayers. Cynthia Bowers, CBS News, South River, North Carolina. More American soldiers died in Iraq today in service of their country. There were dozens of attacks on U.S. troops and an all-night battle on the banks of the Tigris River that ended with the capture of about 60 suspected anti-American fighters. Also taken into custody today was another former top official of Saddam Hussein's government. CBS's Alan Pizzi has late details from Baghdad. This night video of a raid in Tikrit is just one of more than 40 combat incidents in a 24-hour period in which three U.S. troops died and at least 18 were wounded. Hey. Most strikingly, yes. according to Pentagon sources, all but one of those incidents were enemy attacks. Officials say this is an alarming new trend in Iraq. The military used to claim that firefights and casualties were the result of an aggressive U.S. policy to clear up Saddam Hussein diehards. That no longer seems to be the case. But in an example of other means to round up the most wanted, the 101st Airborne kept its massive firepower out of action and used patience to capture number 27 on the U.S. list of the 55 most wanted Iraqis. The former Iraqi Defense Minister, General Sultan Hashim Ahmed, surrendered to the 101st Major General David Petraeus after I'm weeks of negotiation and, and American guarantees he would not be prosecuted. But Saddam Hussein is still at large. His mystique seems to grow with every day he remains free. A roadside bomb near a base used by U.S. forces and the Iraqi police they are training to take over security underscored the ease with which Saddam's supporters, or those who just want the U.S. out of Iraq, can operate. The Americans are hoping that the peaceful surrender of the defense minister will encourage other wanted members of the Iraqi regime to give themselves up and will also help discourage some of the violence. So far tonight, it looks like that message hasn't gotten through. Alan Pizzi, CBS News, Baghdad. 
While increasingly organized guerrilla war style attacks are a top concern for American forces in Iraq, ordinary Iraqis are faced with an extraordinary surge of crime, banditry and thuggery, from carjacking and robbery to kidnapping and murder. And as CBS's Kimberly Dozier reports, the result is a population fearful, frustrated, angry, and heavily armed. Day or night, these are some of the most dangerous streets on earth. Desperation drives murder and theft. Iraqis have traded fear of a despot for fear of their fellow man, and U.S. troops seem powerless to protect them. Thieves grab up to 70 cars every 24 hours, usually when someone's in them. This time, these Iraqis fought back. Everyone here has a gun. As a gun, not to do the wrong thing, just to protect ourselves. But all that firepower means disputes in Baghdad often end up here. Since the war, Baghdad's hospitals have been flooded with shooting victims. More than 800 a month end up dead, as many as the entire previous year. Also on the rise, kidnapping, sometimes for money, sometimes for no reason at all. Three-year-old Abdullah chased a ball out this front garden into the street in the wealthy Amaria district of Baghdad. The red car come and stop it here and take him after go. No one has contacted the family. Iraqi police and U.S. troops say they can do nothing. All Abdullah's mother can do is pray. Who do you blame for this? The Iraqi police and the American army. They don't do anything. Like other Iraqis, he has taken matters into his own hands and bought a gun. If someone tries to come here again, I kill him. If I can, I kill him. His liberators, the Americans, have failed to protect what he values most. He sees no reason for them to stay. We hope to go out from this country. Kimberly Dozier, CBS News, Baghdad. A reminder that television sometimes has trouble with perspective, so you may want to note that in some areas of Iraq, things are peaceful. Now, will the California recall election go on October 7th or not? After a three-judge federal appeals court panel ordered the vote put off, an 11-judge panel of the same court today said it will take another look at that ruling. In the campaign, the recall target, Governor Gray Davis, got down and funky with former Vice President Al Gore to the beat of James Brown's sex machine. They hope this will help Davis if and when people finally do step up to the voting machine. Ahead on the CBS Evening News, bullies on the bus. Is violence against the vulnerable out of control in many American schools? A strange new twist today in the sexual assault case against basketball star Kobe Bryant, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department has arrested a 31-year-old Swiss bodybuilder who allegedly contacted Bryant's security staff and offered to murder Bryant's accuser for $3 million. It's hardly murder for hire, but the brutality school bus and schoolhouse bullies inflict on vulnerable classmates can be traumatic. Some experts say bullying is increasing and is out of control in many American schools. CBS's Sandra Hughes reports one mother is taking school officials to court after seeing what happened to her child. It was a school bus camera that caught the cruelty on tape. After kicking 12-year-old Casey Woodruff, his tormentors follow him to the back of the bus to deliver a beating. When I saw the tape and I actually saw what was happening to him, it was much more violent than my mind could imagine, and it just broke my heart. The Woodruff family says it's suing the Eugene, Oregon School District because after repeatedly asking for help, the district still took no meaningful action to protect Casey. School officials deny the claim, arguing they did discipline the offenders. This was something where you know, school officials had followed the proper procedures and had responded appropriately to each of the claims. The abuse never stopped, it escalated. Which is also what Judy Cavish says happened at her son's Manhattan Beach, California grade school after she told teachers he was being abused by bullies constantly. It felt like every little name that someone called me was tearing a little piece of my body apart. 
When Jason refused to go back to school, the family hired a lawyer to file their own federal suit. These children are humiliated and very often school district officials turn a blind eye and engage in what's known as deliberate indifference. Manhattan Beach officials say they have a very strong program in the district against bullying. There are fears without strict policies, it's only a matter of time before someone gets seriously hurt again. Remember Columbine High School? Some claim officials knew the gunmen were being bullied and did nothing about it. The principal denies that. But while gun violence in schools has dropped since then because of zero tolerance policies, bullying hasn't. It's about 30% of kids in the United States are still either bullies or victims or both bullies and victims. Which is why Casey Woodruff and Jason Cavish's parents want zero tolerance against bullying starting in elementary school. Sandra Hughes, CBS News, Los Angeles. Still ahead on the CBS Evening News, our Friday consumer alert. Don't sign a thing before you see it. You'll see why in just a moment. And now to the fine print and why you really need to put on your glasses, pull out the magnifying glass, do whatever it takes to read it before you sign anything. You could be signing away some of your rights and that could cost you plenty. As Jim Acosta's investigation shows you in our Friday Consumer Alert. The roof was installed improperly. Mary Cohn tried to sue her home builder over a house filled with defects. Our house was infiltrated with mold and it made my children ill living in this home. But she didn't exactly find a welcome mat at the courthouse. It's a rigged poker game. I'm not going to win. Buried in Cohn's closing papers was a waiver, giving up her rights to file a lawsuit. The dispute had to be settled through binding arbitration. When I had taken my closing contract to an attorney to read it over, he said to me, This is the finest consumer defect case that I've seen in my career, and you're going to lose it. Consumer advocates warn arbitration rules are designed to protect business. Instead of a courtroom, cases are tried in a private conference room. And instead of a judge and jury, there's an arbitrator whose decisions are almost always final. Everything in the house was just, it just looked crooked. After finding structural flaws in their home, Linda and Jerry no, Ryer faced right. arbitration like, like with their builder. The Did mean. you win? No. You had to pay him? Yes. How much? $52,000 would have been his award. And that was until the Ryers say they were able to prove their arbitrator had an undisclosed prior relationship with the builder. A court agreed and tossed out the award. Big business defends arbitration clauses, which are showing up in the fine print of all sorts of contracts, from credit cards to long-distance phone service. They've become common because the courts have become clogged and litigation has become extremely expensive. The American Arbitration Association insists in its system, most consumers win. In fact, it's very, very difficult for an individual to take on a corporation in a lawsuit. They'll outlast you, they'll outspend you, they'll drive you into the ground if they choose to do that. That's my sign against the builder. Unable to sue and opposed to arbitration, Mary Cohn instead put a sign in her house blasting her home builder. Now the builder is suing her. Jim Acosta, CBS News, Fort Worth, Texas. On the CBS Market Watch, after yesterday's big rally on Wall Street, investors collected some of their profits today, which sent the Dow and the Nasdaq down a bit. The Dow is still ahead, nearly 2% for the week. The Nasdaq, nearly 3% for the week. Still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News. They say after a while, pets start to look like their owners. Why that could be bad for the pet's health, next. This country's problem with obesity has been well documented, but a new report finds it's even worse than you may have realized. It is now an epidemic of inhuman proportions, as CBS's Mika Brzezinski reports. Like many Americans, Max is a bit of a glutton. He's about five pounds overweight, but so am I. So. <laughs> Eating is part of his daily, perhaps hourly, routine. He slaps his food bowl. He just keeps slapping it until we come in and give him some food. The National Academy of Sciences says Max is part of a nationwide epidemic. A 500-page report sums up the problem. Americans are projecting their bad eating habits on their pets, snacking too much, you want a little piece of bagel? and exercising too little. Like 14-pound Miss Piggy or 22-pound Sydney, who eats to live and lives to eat. He looks like an overweight man who drinks too much beer. 
But these animals are all at risk of heart disease, diabetes, and other health problems. Look at your belly. Deborah Greco specializes in animal obesity. She says cat owners are training their pets away from their natural hunting instincts. Instead of going out and catching something, you just make eyes at your owner and you get food. The Academy says if a cat looks overweight, it probably is. And if you can't feel a dog's ribs, oh, Lordy. he's fat too. Kibbles and Bits Lean. Kibbles and The pet industry has taken notice, pushing low-fat foods. There are even doggy day camps to work off those extra pounds. But the solution is simple. Discipline at the dinner table. When Fido <laughs> sings for his supper, take a pause and use a little restraint. Mika Brzezinski, CBS News, New York. And that's part of our world tonight. Sunday morning on Face the Nation, Bob Schieffer's guest will be Democratic presidential hopeful John Edwards. I'll see you again Monday, right here on the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting from New York. Good night. For news 24 hours a day, log on to cbsnews.com. How to turn your walls from bland to beautiful on the Saturday Early Show. Experience CBS News.